Chicago Public Radio. This is Odyssey. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. In a world of six billion people, it can be quite difficult to keep accurate statistics. Nevertheless, there are things that we want to know, to count and to measure about the planet and the people on it. One of the things that people want to know very much is how many human beings live in poverty. The statistics for measuring this number have been under some fire. Take, for example, the dollar a day line, a measure of the number of people worldwide who live on a dollar a day or less. The measure is kind of crude on its face, but one of its more egregious faults, according to critics, is that it has led to substantial undercounting of the world's poor. Other critics have taken aim at measures like gross national product, GNP, per capita, as a measure of wealth in a given country. This number is an average. It can't tell you who has the money or what it's like to live without it. These deficiencies in measurements of poverty have led, over the past several years, to alternative approaches to thinking about the problem of poverty and therefore of ways to measure it. On today's edition of Odyssey, we are going to talk about some of these different approaches to defining and measuring poverty and what these approaches have to say about the very nature of the problem. We're joined today here in Chicago by philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Joining us from New York City is philosopher Thomas Pogge and economist Sanjay Reddy. Sanjay Reddy, you and your studio mate there in New York have written together criticizing the dollar a day measurement. Can you tell me a little more about what your criticisms of that statistic are? Yes, Gretchen. Um, as you know, the World Bank is the institution that produces um, estimates of global poverty. And the criterion that it uses is whether or not individuals have a dollar a day um, of income or consumption. And it defines people who have an income less than this as being absolutely poor. Um, our work on poverty is about two years old now. We started it about two years ago. And uh, over a very lengthy process of investigating how exactly uh, these estimates are done, we've come to the conclusion that they're not reliable and that, in fact, we don't know the true number of people in the world who live in absolute poverty. And the central reason for our conclusion here is that the dollar a day standard, in our view, focuses on the wrong thing. It focuses on a money metric measure, as economists call it, which refers to the means that people have to achieve an end, but it doesn't refer to the ends that people actually achieve. And in our view, this leads to an analysis that's quite um, mistaken and uh, has various inconsistencies, and the end result is a set of estimates that can't be believed. Uh, let me just give you an example of how that might work. Please. The, the dollar-a-day estimate, uh, as I said, refers to how many people in the world seem to have a level of consumption that falls beneath that, but that doesn't tell us whether or not they have enough resources, for instance, to be adequately nourished, let alone to meet the other requirements of an adequate human life. And if we are to ask that very different question that focuses on what people actually need, we might come up with a very different number. Moreover, the way in which we translate the dollar a day standard into the currencies of different countries would be very different if we focus on basic necessities that are required in order to avoid poverty rather than on goods and services in general. Thomas Pogge, anything else that you want to add um, in terms of the, the criticisms of the dollar a day line? Yeah, I think one might add that the dollar a day line is defined as Sanjay, right. and as Sanjay already implicitly uh, suggest that it is defined in terms of purchasing power parities. So you're not asking how many people have less than a dollar a day as exchanged at market exchange rates, but rather you're asking how many people are below what is deemed to be equivalent to a dollar a day in this country. And here the big problem is that the World Bank in converting dollar amounts into the currencies of other countries is using official purchasing power parities which are based on the overall consumption of the world at large. So it's basically an average of the price ratios across different countries. You take a goods basket that reflects international consumption and then ask yourself what that basket, that representative basket would cost, let's say in India versus in the United States. And if you can get it for one fifth the cost in India, then you multiply all incomes in India by a factor of five. What's wrong with that is that, of course, the consumption of the poor is highly atypical. The poor do and have to focus their consumption on a very narrow subset of the entire set of commodities. 
and there's absolutely no guarantee that the price differentials with regard to those commodities is close to the price differential with regard to commodities in general. So, in general. so the basket of goods doesn't really reflect necessarily the priorities of, of the poor in terms of what they want to consume with their dollar a day. Yes, that is exactly right. And uh, what limited evidence that we have suggests that, in fact, the discrepancies are quite significant and that the World Bank would arrive at rather higher poverty numbers, even relative to its uh, relatively arbitrary $1 a day line, if it used more appropriate ways of translating the uh, international poverty line into the currencies of other countries. We're talking today on the program about how we measure poverty and some of the implications of those measurements. Martha Nussbaum, another measure that has been um, around for years and certainly when people talked about um, devel the developing world and growing wealth in the developing world, one number that gets referred to a lot is gross national product per capita, um, something like how much wealth per person there is in, the, in a country. Um, is that a, a figure that's still used, and are there problems with a figure like that? Well, because it's an easy figure to use, I'm afraid it is still used uh, all too much to rank countries. But you can see that it's really a very bad way of thinking about how a country is developing. First of all, it doesn't even take distribution into account. And so it can give very high marks to a country that has staggering inequalities. In the old days of using that, South Africa used to shoot to the top of the list of developing countries because of its great uh, rich riches, uh, even though, of course, the large majority of the people couldn't command any of that. Another problem it has is that there are some very important aspects of uh, human life uh, that are closely connected with the experience of poverty, such as health and education, that are not very well correlated with the GNP. You can increase GNP and not increase the health status of a population because the poor may have virtually no access to health care. And of course, our own country has a big problem in that area. Uh, Let education me stop you for one second. Are yeah. those things not correlated to income or not correlated to GNP? They're not correlated to GNP. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but you know the thing that's always interested me particularly is the uh, inadequacy of this standard in uh, looking at things that are of particular importance to women who are trying to live well. I mean, women's poverty in many parts of the world is not exactly the same experience as male poverty. There, there are four aspects of it that make it quite a, a different thing. First of all, women and girls do a vast uh, proportion of the domestic labor that's done all around the world. And that isn't recognized typically as work. It's not paid work. But it stands between the adult woman and going out and getting a job. It stands between the little girl and going to school. So, so that's a very important thing. Second, women are disproportionately subject to violence, both outside the home and, and especially inside the home. I mean, we, we don't even know how many women are being beaten daily in their homes, but in our country and in developing countries equally, there's a tremendous problem of violence against women. Third problem is employment discrimination. Women and girls suffer great discrimination in many kinds of jobs in many, many parts of the world. And so um, when they try to get out of poverty, they have that additional barrier to get over. And finally, they may have no, no land rights at all or unequal property rights, and they may have no access to credit. So suppose a woman wants to leave an abusive marriage, set up on her own, open a little business. How can she do it? She can't get a loan. Okay, so we've got concerns about measures that don't adequately, first of all, capture everyone who's poor, that don't capture uh, the, the, the material realities of the, the correlation of a particular income level to life in a particular place and that don't capture um, differences uh, between how poverty might be experienced in the same place or in different places. All right, that's a lot of critique, a um, lot of problems. So what to be done about it? Well, that's part of our question today as we talk about measuring poverty. You are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Let's begin on our program to talk about alternatives. Um, Thomas Pogge, I'd like to start with you uh, because you have a, an alternative approach to thinking about how we capture poverty that's not worlds away from what goes on now. So tell me how you think the current approach to measuring might be improved. Well, uh, I think first we should clarify what we mean by poverty here. Uh, one way of understanding poverty is just to look at how well people are able to meet their basic economic needs. And uh, then there is the broader question of what standard we should use, what general criterion of well-being we should use in the context, for example, of assessing a particular institutional schemes such as the global economic order or the economic order or the, the general institutional order of a particular country. 
Now, I prefer to use the concept of poverty relatively narrowly, uh, so I would not integrate into the concept of poverty some of the things that Martha Nussbaum has just mentioned, even though, of course, I think that they are very much part and a central part of any acceptable conception of justice, of social justice. Uh, the second thing we have to clarify is what we want a particular criterion of poverty for. And again, if we start out from the problem that you started the show with, namely the problem of assessing poverty worldwide, of keeping track of the so-called United Nations Millennium Goals, then I think a relatively narrow conception of poverty is appropriate, where you basically just focus on the basic capabilities, the basic needs that human beings have, and try to price these basic needs, what is required for people to meet these basic needs, price that out in the various currencies, and then ask yourself, who does not have uh, the currency amount that is necessary to meet these basic needs in the various countries? Um, well, tell me, first of all, what counts as a basic need? Some of them are obvious, but I want to find out if there are any non-obvious ones. Yeah, I think they are all obvious. I would say uh, the main things are nutrition, uh, clean water, food, adequate nutrients, shelter, clothing, and basic health care, basic education. So then in terms of measuring, the measurement is whether people have all of those things or the measurement of how much income they would need to get those things. I would say the latter, or rather uh, I would say uh, that people have access to these things. So in some countries, for example, access to these things may be provided by way of a public good. So there may be a public health system where you can, without paying anything, you simply have access to minimally adequate health care. In that case, of course, you don't need money to have that access, whereas in other countries you need that kind of money. Okay, so um, by way of giving things some names, because we're going to need these terms later on, <laughs> we want to say um, you take what is called a resourcist approach. You want to look at the resources that people have, not just money, not just income, um, but things like clean water and health care, um, things that are around the people that they can then use to make their life. Yes, that is correct, but let me add one thing that, uh, as I said before, the concept of poverty does not exhaust the entire metric that we need for assessing individual advantage for purposes of a conception of justice. So in that broader enterprise of a conception of social justice, I would throw in further things, like, for example, the rights that people have, their civic status, their possibilities of participation, and also, and importantly, some of the things that Martha has mentioned about uh, the domestic situation and so forth. Now, Martha Nussbaum, we need to take a break, but uh, the approach that you advocate is, is really different, doesn't look at the resources that people have, really flips things around. Can you give us a brief preview? Well, the question that I would ask is, what are people actually able to do and to be able to do and to be? What are the uh, opportunities that they have available to them? And what uh, Amartya Sen and I have, have called this is the capabilities approach. We, we try to find out what people are capable of doing in a range of areas that are not all that different from the ones that Thomas mentioned. But, but what I would like to do is to look at the issue of minimal justice, a minimally decent society quite broadly, because I think uh, a lot of these different factors are, are really uh, interrelated and that it's difficult to, to, to think about nutrition without thinking about freedom from violence, et cetera. So I would just like to, to look across the board and see whether people have available to them the opportunities to pursue a number of these very important human goods. Well, we'll come back and talk about what some of those human goods are and hear a little bit more about the capabilities approach. But first, we shall take a break. Stay with us. There's a lot more to come. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and you're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. 
are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and on today's program, we're talking about measuring poverty. There's been a lot of criticism in recent years about the way organizations like the UN and the World Bank measure poverty around the world, maybe primarily because it undercounts, these, these, these measures undercount the number of poor people in the world. So we're talking today about some alternative ways of thinking about poverty and therefore of measuring it. Joining us for our conversation are Thomas Pogge. He is a philosopher at Columbia University in New York City. He's the author of World Poverty and Human Rights, Cosmopolitan Responsibilities and Reforms. He is joining us from New York City, as is Sanjay Reddy, an economist at Barnard College at Columbia. Sanjay Reddy has written extensively on development economics and on economics and philosophy. Here in Chicago, we are joined by Martha Nussbaum. Martha Nussbaum is a philosopher in the Department of Philosophy, in the Law School, and in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. She is the author of many books, including Women and Human Development. Martha Nussbaum, let's um, dig in a little more on the capabilities approach. As we were saying before the break, one approach is to look at the resources that people have, um, inputs, if we can put it that way, into their lives that they might be able to make use of, um, and think about poverty in terms of having or not having those things. Capabilities approach is really different. Tell me a little more about where your starting point is. Well, the starting point is that, that people haven't really been given what they need until they're actually able to choose to go out and do that thing, whatever it is. They, they haven't really been given uh, the right to an education unless they're actually able to avail themselves of that. Now, then the difference with Thomas, which is a, a subtle one, I think, comes in the fact that we notice that uh, people have different abilities to convert the resources that they have into actual choice and functioning. A woman may have a much harder time taking advantage of education opportunities that she has than, than a man because uh, she may be threatened with violence should she leave the home a little girl may be told you got to do the housework and so on so typically producing female literacy is a more expensive matter than producing male literacy and so giving just the same amount of resources won't solve that problem but if you ask well these people what are they actually able to go out and do then I think you come closer to diagnosing some of the persistent obstacles in the way of, of functioning that uh, many deprived people may encounter. So you want to say that the measure is not do people have, um, you know, what is the amount of money it takes to go and get literacy, uh, not even necessarily to be literate, but to go and get literate if they want to be literate. Yes. Um, that's an important distinction. But also to say, uh, you know, can this particular person, this individual do it? And they might need a different bundle of resources, more or less resources than someone else. The the measure, the 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 point at which we want to look at whether everybody's okay is the question of whether they really can convert their resources into a, an opportunity to go and get that thing. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you don't want to look at their actually going to get it. This is what's so complicated. You want to look at their opportunity to go and get it because, uh, very importantly, the approach wants to leave room for human choice and, and freedom. So except for compulsory education of children and a few exceptions like that, we would want to say, you know, if somebody chooses not to vote, that that's fine, but you, you want to make sure they're really able to vote. So if the polling places are very far from the homes of poor people and there's no public transportation system, they may have the right on paper, but they're not actually able to go out to do it. Now, Sanjay Reddy, um, in practice, you, you two are a, a capabilities man, if we can say it that way. Um, in practice, what's the difference between your approach, a capabilities approach, and a resource approach? Gretchen, um, you are right. I am an enthusiast of the capabilities approach, uh, at least for certain problems. Uh, and certain purposes. And uh, in particular, I do think that in assessing the extent of poverty and deprivation, uh, capabilities offer um, the most fruitful lens to address that issue. And uh, the reason is the reason I pointed to earlier, uh, which is that they focus on the beings and doings, as Martha put it, uh, that people can actually achieve and not merely on the means that they have. And surely that's what's got to be important. I think Thomas's concern is that capabilities uh, pay too much heed to interpersonal diversity and that something in the idea of fair fair treatment from, from a society is lost uh, in that focus on interpersonal diversity. Um, I, I, I think he might be afraid that uh, too many resources will go to those who are extremely needy uh, from a capability-centered standpoint that seeks to bring up those who have a hard time transforming resources into capabilities uh, to a common uh, threshold. And uh, I think that that concern is a little bit uh, overstated. Uh, 
there are some systematic forms of human diversity associated, for instance, with gender and age, which have to be taken account of in any kind of assessment uh, at a population-wide level, uh, such as regarding how many people are poor. Um, and of course, there is a lot of area of overlap between the resources view and the capability view in this sense, which is why Thomas and I could write a paper together on the inadequacies of the World Bank's money metric approach to measuring poverty, precisely because the two approaches do come together at an operational level uh, very frequently. Um, let me just say one more thing, which is that to specify the resources that people ought to be able to claim, be, ought to be able to, to, to claim from society, requires in turn some attention to capability-like considerations. Um, we would have to assess what forms of human diversity exist and what is the uh, distribution of the abilities that people have to transform resources into capabilities in order to set what we think would be a reasonable amount of resources uh, that people uh, could reasonably claim from the society they belong to. And uh, so in that way, I think Thomas's resourcism is really uh, dependent on the fundamental uh, evaluative insights of a capability perspective. Well, Thomas Pogge, um, I'll let you describe your <laughs> objections, but let me let me put it in a form of a specific question. If on an operational level there might be tremendous overlap between a capabilities approach and a resources approach like yours, why should a person prefer one over the? Why should a person prefer prefer a resources approach over a capabilities approach? Okay, uh, can I just say four things about this problem? Not all of them addressed exactly to your question, because I also want to respond to what Martha and Sanjay have said. Okay. Uh, first, I agree very strongly that, of course, a resources account, to be at all plausible, must have some sort of a capability or needs or human requirements account in the background, because we can't pick up the resources just at random. For example, the fact that nutrients are important and sand is not important for human life is something that you know only if you know something about human needs. So that much is very clear. We need a capability account in the background to tell us uh, at what level to set a particular resources threshold, like a poverty line, and also what weight to give to the various different resources. Uh, secondly, one important reason, and this gets now to your question, for preferring a resources account is that it gives you a certain amount of clarity in this sense. There are resources out there on which human beings make conflicting claims. And if you talk in the space of resources, you can better describe how things are now distributed, right? In the capability language, you could say this many people are now unable to meet their basic nutritional needs, and that's terrible. In the resource language, you can say something more strongly than that. You can say that one-fifth of all human beings, namely those who now live below the World Bank's $1 a day poverty line, have one-third of 1% 1 of the global social product. So you can know something in the resource language about how much it would cost us, the rich people in the rich countries, to eradicate poverty completely. We have one-fifth of all human beings poor, and it would cost us much less than 1% of our income in the rich countries to eradicate poverty. That's what a reality, that's what a resourcist approach can bring out much more sharply. Now let me say something about the problem about uh, the interpersonal differences in the capacities to convert resources into valuable functionings. The examples that Martha has given, I'm completely on her side. I agree completely because here the differences are due to social factors. And in our world, the vast majority of these conversion capacity differences are due to social factors. For example, to the fact that people as children have suffered malnutrition and therefore now have lesser capacities, greater health problems, and so forth. These questions, of course, raise problems of justice, and a just society would compensate for those problems and, more importantly, would try to prevent those kinds of problems from arising in the future to begin with. However, there are also natural causes for differences in people's conversion capacities. And here, a resources approach would be more hesitant to say that justice requires compensation. So if I may give you a thought experiment of two workers who are both single, who are working equal numbers of hours, they're equally productive, they work in the same job. And the only difference is that the one person has a faster metabolism and thus needs somewhat more food in order to be equally well nourished with the other. Under those circumstances, the resources, and I count myself in that number, of course, the resources would say that they should get equal pay for equal work and they should be taxed at equal rates. 
uh, that's where the capability approach may differ. They may say, no, it's uh, through no choice of their own that the one worker has a faster metabolism than the other. And we should try to compensate for that by taxing the person with the slow metabolism at a higher rate in order to provide extra food to the person who has the faster metabolism. Okay, you're now, saying that justice doesn't require that. I'm saying justice does not require that. Something and, else and might, but not justice. That is correct. So if uh, the person with the fast metabolism, if we are talking about a situation in which uh, that person's survival is threatened, then of course we have very strong and very important moral duties, call them duties of solidarity, duties of humanity, to make sure that that person gets enough to eat and we all should work that extra hour. But uh, as a matter of principle, I don't think justice requires that we depart from an equal pay for equal work standard in order to accommodate this difference in conversion capacities. Okay, let me jump in here because I do want to remind folks that we're talking about measuring poverty today and we're going to take some phone calls later in the program. Our number is 1-888-859-1800. one 859 1800 So give us a call if you'd like to join in our conversation. Thomas Pogge is a philosopher and he's joining us today from New York City as is economist Sanjay Reddy. And here in Chicago, we're joined by philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Now, Martha Nussbaum, you have actually undertaken to specify um, the, the capability, a set of capabilities, to propose a set of capabilities um, that would constitute uh, a minimum um, level of um, capabilities that people would need to have to begin to undertake a good life. Yeah, I've tried to give it some content because I think you can't answer the kind of objection that Thomas raises without specifying what are the capabilities that are part of a minimal account of justice. Uh, certainly, there are some, you don't just want to maximize all capabilities to do everything, and that, that just seems to be a useless conception. So you want to say, what are the most important human needs, and what is an account of what people ought to be able to do and to be in any decent society? And I think of this as closely connected to constitution making. What are the constitutional entitlements that any country ought to guarantee to all its people. And related to human rights. I mean, this definitely mm -hmm, echoes mm -hmm. a human rights sort of language. Yeah, it's very closely linked to a human rights approach. The only reason I, <clears throat> I don't um, say that it's exactly the same thing is that I think sometimes, especially in the U.S., especially in the U.S., the language of rights is understood in terms of what's uh, called negative liberty. That is, the state keep their hands off and then everything is supposed to be fine. I actually think that the idea of negative liberty is not a coherent idea. I think that uh, even property rights and, and contract uh, and, and so on re require strong affirmative state action and so that no liberties are really negative liberties. But in any case, I think that the liberties I'm interested in require quite a lot of action uh, to provide adequate nutrition, adequate health care, and so on. And so I don't even think that the distinction that's so familiar in the human rights literature between first and second generation rights is all that helpful. I mean, th that's supposed to capture the distinction between the political and civil rights on the one hand and the economic and social rights on the other. But I think what the capabilities uh, thinking shows you is that all rights have a material aspect. To be able to participate in politics requires some education, it requires some nutrition, and so on. So, so you can't think well about the political and civil rights without thinking also about the economic and social. Well, give me, some, some, give me a sense of how uh, broad your list is. I mean, there are obviously basic things about life and health that we, I think, everybody would assume would be on the list. Then you've got some things that people might not assume or might not, not automatically know were on the list? Well, it's, it closely tracks some of the things in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but where I would go beyond the thin list that uh, Thomas Poga gave a little while back, uh, certainly bodily integrity is an extremely important element of the list, and I think that's one of the first things that you want to look at uh, for, for women. Uh, property rights, so having the ability to own property on a basis of equality with other citizens. The political rights and liberties, I think, are very important. The access to political participation in the political process. And also, I add um, opportunity to play and to have some leisure, because I think that's an aspect of a human life, and it is in the Universal Declaration, in fact. But it's an aspect that women so often miss out on when they have to work all day at a demanding job, and then they come home and they do all the child care and the elder care. There's something lacking in their life the ability to express themselves. And uh, so I include those more nebulous things. I also include emotional health, the conditions of being able to live without crippling fear, the uh, ability to have justified anger and to express it publicly without fear and so on. So all of those things might seem a little bit more uh, nebulous, but I think they're really very important. 
Now, Sanjay Reddy, not everyone in the capabilities tradition would accept perhaps any list, but certainly there would be disagreement over the elements of a specific list. Um, what do you think about Martha's list and the, and the enterprise of list making? Yes, uh, Gretchen. Um, let me start by making a start by making a distinction between poverty and deprivation. Uh, it seems to me we have to separate the enterprise of measuring poverty, which is a very specific kind of task, from that of determining how much deprivation exists in the world, which is a somewhat broader task. For example, an individual may suffer from a chronic disease and be deeply deprived, but also be very wealthy. And we wouldn't call that person poor because the, dis the, the disadvantage they suffer, indeed the capability disadvantage, is not by reason of their having inadequate income, it's by reason of their disease. And similarly, many people in the world suffer injustices by reason of uh, poor political institutions that deny them rights and so on. And uh, those are deprivations, but we might not want to classify them as poverty. So I think we should separate those two kinds of of, of exercises in our discussion. Let me jump uh, in for one second because sure. I need to give our phone number again. It's one eight 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 five nine one eight zero zero. One triple eight eight five nine eighteen hundred is the number. It's toll free if you'd like to join in our conversation uh, with a question or a comment. Please give us a call. You are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Sandy, ready? Go on. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think we should also separate uh, the question of uh, what constitutes a, a way to assess well-being uh, and deprivation from what are the operational claims that people ought to be able to make in a just society, the enterprise of constitution making, as Martha Nussbaum put it. Those two are very different tasks. And we might well think that the way we should assess whether somebody is deprived uh, ought to adopt certain criteria, uh, but that uh, it may or may not be possible to operationalize this in a constitution and to make it a justiciable claim that people can demand, for example, in a court of law, that they ought to have uh, uh, particular kinds of entitlements. Um, this problem becomes even more acute when you uh, move to the kind of maximal list which Martha Nussbaum has presented, which includes, for instance, such things as having opportunities for sexual satisfaction. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Fourier uh, certainly agreed that that was a very important entitlement, and he had this fantastic universe in his writing in the uh, 19th century. Uh, in which uh, members of a community could demand sexual services from those who were more attractive in the community in order to uh, create these opportunities for sexual satisfaction. And that, that's a really you know, rather fascinating kind of vision. Um, but it's not clear that it's one that everyone would agree to. Similarly, um, Martha has on her list uh, the opportunity to possess po property rights on an equal basis with others. Uh, and I believe she includes here property both in land and in movable goods. And as you know, uh, again, there's a distinguished tradition in political philosophy of contesting whether uh, property rights ought to exist in certain kinds of things. Henry George was a famous example of, again, a 19th century figure who denied that there should be property rights in land, even though he would allow for property rights uh, in certain other things. So this is a contested terrain. There's room for a great deal of discussion uh, about what ought to be or not ought, ought not to be on such a list. And I think uh, we might do the the task of measuring the most acute deprivations and especially poverty a disservice by focusing on the, this kind of a maximal list, uh, even though it might be uh, a value from certain standpoints. Uh, and, and certainly it reflects particular kinds of judgments, and I don't think it can be said to be the product of consensus or universal agreement at this stage. Sunday Reddy, we need to take a break. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation and take some phone calls at one 859 one eight zero zero. Stay with us. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and you're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio.
welcome back to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Our conversation today is about measuring poverty. We've been hearing about some alternative approaches to measuring poverty, alternative to approaches that are widely used by organizations like the UN and the World Bank to measure the number of people in the world who live in poverty. We are joined for our conversation from New York City by economist Sanjay Reddy. He is an economist at Barnard College at Columbia University. With him in New York is Thomas Pogge, a philosopher at Columbia University. And here in Chicago, we are joined by philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Our phone number again, 1-888-859-1800. Let's take a call from Merv. Hello, Merv. You're on Odyssey. Hi. Uh, my question is, at what point in the evolution of uh, political thought did uh, the concept of right for uh, happiness become supplanted, or, or, or supplant rather, uh, the pursuit of happiness as a right. Uh, your, one of your guests was enumerating a long list of, of rights, which sound great, but to me they, uh, they're guaranteeing a whole lot more than just the pursuit of happiness. I'll take my call for here. Martha Nussbaum, I think that was you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think actually many traditions, if not uh, all, have had some idea of an uh, urgent entitlement based on justice, on justice. And that's really what the idea of a right is. And my capabilities are the subset of all the abilities that people have that I think are that kind of urgent entitlement based on basic justice. Uh, and I don't think that's a very new idea. I think that the, the content is, is, is perhaps somewhat new. And I think it's very interesting that the ones that pertain specifically to women uh, have not been recognized as fundamental human rights until fairly recently. And I want to comment on, on Sanjay Reddy's examples. Uh, all constitutional traditions uh, start off with something very vague, and they make it more concrete, usually starting with the worst abuses first. I mean, South Africa has this housing right, and they've started out by saying, well, it's not right to destroy the dwellings of the pavement dwellers and they move on from there. Well, I think the obvious thing that I want to protect against in my uh, thing about access to uh, opportunities for sexual satisfaction is uh, non-consensual child marriage, the absence of marital consent in many countries of the world, the practices of female genital mutilation practiced on unwilling on non-consenting girls, the practice of uh, child sexual abuse and child prostitution. Those are the things that it would make sense for a constitutional tradition to start with. And of course, uh, the particular shape that any of these uh, countries will take in implementing any of these things is, is up to that country. And, and the reason that I make the reason that I make the list so vague is precisely is to leave that kind of room for the operationalizing to be done by each country in its own way. And you're not saying the government ought to supply everybody with a sex partner or something like no, that? No, I'm not. I mean, I, th I think some uh, th there are some aspects of my larger reproductive uh, right uh, which could be debated. I mean, certainly some people in this country think that infertile couples ought to have access to public funds in, in order to have infertility treatment, and that's one of the things that a, a fairly wealthy country could debate. But, but I'm worried about just preventing the gross abuses that stand between many uh, women and any access to choice in matters of sex in their lives at all. All right, let's... Uh, Christian, if I, if I could just sure, step in, I, I, I just absolutely like to agree with Martha about the importance of those particular uh, foci, and uh, I think we're, you know, we're, we, we have complete consensus there, uh, but my uh, concern is precisely that in undertaking a maximal specification of the list, one might lose a lot of consensus, and uh, one might also inappropriately attribute uh, objective truth to things that are in fact uh, not just contested but contestable. Uh, so uh, I think where we would all agree is on the need to focus on an area of overlap uh, that uh, can reasonably be supported and that would be a much smaller list. If but it would be a list but at I all. think it's always good to leave people leeway, and that's why I want to specify these rather generally, and then leave it to people. I mean, a free speech right used to mean just no prior restraint on publication. That was the worst abuse, and then people moved on from there to protect more and more types of speech, and right now different countries do that somewhat differently, and I think that's just exactly as it should be. The country should figure out what to start with, what's the worst abuse, and then move on from there in their own way. 
All right, let's take so, another... So this is a resource for constitution makers yeah, then, yeah. I suppose. I mean, I'm, it's not, I, I, it's not I, meant to be I've an objective... I've started a new center for comparative valuable. constitutionalism. Well, objectivity, I, you know, I understand in the Rawlsian sense, that is, one would hope this has a, a degree of political objectivity in the sense that people could agree that it's a reasonable basis for, for, for uh, constitution making. But In a sense, lots of people with different values and yeah, different views different of a good life could say, yeah, we like say, that too. Could say, we'll start with, with this. All right, let's uh, let's move on to another call. Let's talk with... John. Hello, John. You're on Odyssey. Hi there. How are you? I'm all right. That's good. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, one of the ladies, uh, I think she's the one from UC, mentioned uh, a, a need for happiness or joy or play. Play, yeah. I think you said. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm wondering, I haven't heard in the course of nearly an hour anyone mention the hierarchy of needs of Abraham Maslow. Despite the fact that it is in disfavor, in as much as he didn't do any research, it came out of his head, uh, it has um, uh, stood the test of time in terms of what people have found out when they've gone from the United States to try to help third world countries, etc., that you're not going to get very far if people are starving. And I'm just wondering if um, you're not aware of the third four psychologists or what's going on. Well, you know, I think that's a very interesting approach, and certainly all, all the people who work on capabilities do think about it. I myself would, would resist the idea that you take things in that kind of a sequential uh, order. I think, uh, you know, the political rights and liberties don't come after uh, dealing with hunger, but in fact, as, as Amartya Sen has long argued, they're, they're very closely intertwined uh, because in a country that does have a free press and access uh, to the political process for poor people, you're much more likely to be able to prevent uh, famine. So I guess I would just rather think of them as all intertwined and interlocking, and, and uh, you know, if, if we can defend the idea that they're urgent human needs, then, then they're all, um, at least uh, in that sense, on a par. Thomas Pogge, let me ask you about that, because I'm wondering whether in terms of resources there is a, a hierarchy within the resources that you specified, or whether the hierarchy comes from the fact that you didn't specify other resources. No, there's obviously a hierarchy in the resources in that uh, I would uh, agree that we need to think of these resources as to some extent interdependent, so we can't think of social and political rights as separate from social and economic rights, but we can, within these broad categories, of course, have a hierarchy and say that some rights are more important than other rights within each of these categories. So I mean, most obviously, if you think about uh, economic rights, for example, meeting the very minimal requirements of human survival is obviously more important than uh, having more income at higher levels, where you can then meet more discretionary needs. All right, let's take another call. Let's talk with Juliet. Hello, Juliet. You're on Odyssey. Hi, Gretchen. Thanks for taking my call. I love your show. Thank you. Um, my question deals with qualitative markers for poverty, like, for example, literacy levels among women or literacy levels among mothers. That seems to have a lot of bearing on whether or not the poverty will be generational or temporary. Another might be the ratio of hours of paid to unpaid work per day, things like that. I'd like to just hear your guest thoughts, and I'll take their comments off the air. All right. Um, let me put this to our, our capabilities people, um, either Sanjay or Martha. In terms of back to the question of measuring, which is where we started, um, can you measure capabilities? I mean, can you go out and measure whether people have access to things, or do you have to use some sort of proxy? Well, you have to use a, a, a proxy, and literacy is a an imperfect proxy for what you really want to get out of education. Uh, it's not the worst case of a proxy, but it doesn't tell you everything you want to know, because you want to know not only can the, the girl read and write, but has she been informed about her, the world? Has she learned that she's a citizen with rights that she can pursue? Does she have knowledge of how to file a rape charge if she wants to do that? Uh, and so, you know, I would also stress, and I've been working on the founding of a new university for women in Bangladesh, so I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, you know, the, the, the element of the imagination, the ability to um, think resources forcefully about your situation through the arts, through literature. This is something that can often get left out of a basic literacy approach, but I think that the women's movement worldwide has understood that that's a very, very important part of women's empowerment. Sanjay Reddy? If I could, yeah. Um, I think it's important to note here that, that there are two ways in which different kinds of non-income considerations enter into poverty assessment. One way is constitutively, namely that to take a proper account of what it means to be poor, one has to assess 
what are all of the different forms of capability failure that are experienced by people? Uh, what are the different dimensions in which their lives are deprived as a result of inadequate resources? And, uh, for instance, the fact that a person uh, is unable to go to school uh, or to become literate uh, may be considered to be an aspect of their poverty from this standpoint. But there is a second uh, concern, which is causal, and that has to do with how certain kinds of deprivations uh, cement other kinds of deprivations and lead over time into a kind of lock-in of poverty. And uh, I think uh, you know, both of those um, uh, have to be paid attention to, and there are real um, uh, interde causal interdependencies between the different dimensions of poverty, and it's the case that we have to view poverty in this kind of uh, multi-dimensional way. You're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio, and we've been talking today about measuring poverty, some alternative approaches to assessing poverty, defining it and measuring it, and what those approaches mean. We just have a few minutes left, but I would like to hear from each of you. I'd like to ask you to set your approach in its larger context. In other words, um, Thomas Pogge, let me start with you. Is a resourcist approach to assessing poverty and measuring poverty just about poverty alleviation, or are you asking a different question? Are you proposing a different larger program of which uh, alleviating poverty is one part? Yeah, I'm certainly asking a larger question about uh, justice, and most of my work has been focused really on the question of global justice, of the justice of the institutional, global institutional framework that plays such a large role in determining the uh, structure of the life that people lead, especially in the poor countries. And so in that context, I think, of course, poverty is one very, very important dimension. I would say that the greatest human rights problem that we have in this world, and I would even more strongly call it a human rights violation, the greatest human rights problem that we have is the problem of poverty, that a very large percentage of humankind, quite avoidably and quite foreseeably, cannot meet their elementary needs. Thomas Pogge is a philosopher at Columbia University in New York City. He is the author of World Poverty and Human Rights, Cosmopolitan Responsibilities and Reforms. Sanjay Reddy, tell me how you see the larger project, if there is one, of a capabilities approach. Yes, uh, Gretchen. Um, it, it, it does seem to me important to put the capabilities approach in its larger context. It's not merely uh, a means of measuring uh, or assessing deprivations or poverty but indeed of assessing well-being in general of individuals and of populations. And it directs us away from um, what uh, Adam Smith called opulence, the amount of stuff that a society has, toward uh, the forms of well-being that people can actually achieve from that, and not only in a mental satisfaction sense, but in the sense of, of what they really are able to do with the resources um, that is valuable. And uh, here it's important to underline that even a rich country like the United States um, can benefit from this, from being assessed in this uh, lens, uh, we can ask the question, what are Americans doing with the resources that they have, uh, including those who are well above the poverty line? Are they making maximal use of their capabilities uh, and, and are they achieving valuable capabilities or not? So uh, this, that's a more general standpoint from which this is valuable, but I think what we do have to remember here is that there are real disagreements uh, about what is valuable. There are disagreements about what should be on the list of valued capabilities, how to specify those, and how to weight them and place them within a hierarchy of valuation. And uh, from that standpoint, I think we have to be very modest about what this kind of a lens can do uh, and draw on many other resources for thinking about what justice requires. Sanjay Reddy is an economist at Barnard College at Columbia University in New York, and he joins us today from New York City. Martha Nussbaum, let me ask you the same question with a slight twist um, in the question of the larger project, but specifically for you, why, um, what a philosophical underpinning to something like this, why that matters? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, it matters to lay out some arguments, and I try to root this in an, in an idea of what's a minimum of a life that's required by the idea of human dignity, and, and I, I try to make arguments of that sort, and, and I think it, it, it just helps uh, if one can persuade people with terms that don't depend on one particular religious or metaphysical tradition, but that maybe are the common resource of, of uh, most uh, cultures, if not, not all, and I think the idea of human dignity does 
does have this power to cut across cultural uh, difference. And, and we, we can see that the Indian constitution, the German constitution, there's so many traditions where uh, judges have been able to operate with this idea of what what is a life with the bare minimum of human dignity. Uh, so this gives us some confidence that I think that we can have a cross-cultural dialogue about this in which my part of the project is to try to capture the most urgent uh, entitlements, the, the uh, a notion of a basic social minimum that's a, a minimum of what justice would require. And uh, I think one shouldn't be too um, cautious about this because what happens when one defers too much to tradition is, uh, first of all, that the things connected with women's equality tend to, to, to get left out first. Uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is very uh, thick and very specific about what would be an adequate policy in the area of sexual harassment or in the area of violence against women. Uh, I haven't put all of that thickness into the uh, approach, but I think it's uh, quite quite open um, to, to interpret my vaguer prescriptions in, in that way. The one thing that I further want to say is that I think Thomas Pogue is entirely right that this problem uh, of, of securing the human capabilities to people can't be faced in the end just by each nation in isolation. The uh, project that he's pursued for many years of thinking about what the wealthier nations owe to the poorer nations is an extremely important project. And I, I like the way he pursues it by thinking about the structure of the global economic order and the, the kinds of uh, unfairness and inequality that are built into that. So I'm trying in my, my current work to, to um, follow that lead in my own way. Martha Nussbaum is a philosopher in the Departments of Philosophy, the Law School, and the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. She's the author of Women and Human Development. Martha Nussbaum, Sanjay Reddy, and Thomas Pogge, thank you all very much for joining me today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks also to everyone for listening and for calling. Odyssey's theme music was composed and performed by OK Go. Thanks to our research assistant, James Learis, and to our interns, Ragnar Anderson and Aruna Kilinani. Our technical producer is Steve Warnowskis. Our program is produced by Allison Cuddy and Delia Lloyd. The senior producer of Odyssey is Joshua Andrews. Odyssey is a production of Chicago Public Radio under general manager Tori Malatia. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Join us again next time for Odyssey. Odyssey.